Welcome to Funding and Disrupting, the most in-depth business podcast for companies looking to raise money and the investors who fund them. Every episode, we interview a funded founder plus the investor who funded them to get the real story of how it all came together. If you're searching for funding for a disruptive technology or business, or you're searching for the best companies to invest in, then you've come to the right place. This episode of Funding and Disrupting is brought to you by Aura Collective, a leading tech PR and marketing firm. Let's get funding and disrupting. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Keith Herman, and welcome to today's special extended episode of Funding and Disrupting. We're pleased to have as our venture capital guest, Bryson Hearn, the manager at Village Capital that invests in early stage companies with social and environmental impact. They recently invested in a company named Share App. In addition, we also have our tech founder guest, Eric Shabil. Eric is the founder and CEO of Share App. ShareApp is a free service helping renters co-own their dream home. So having said that, let's welcome our guests, Eric and Bryson. How are you today, gentlemen? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. Fantastic, Keith. Thank you for having us on the show. It's exciting to be here. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. And the audience, hopefully, will we'll get to learn quite a bit from both of you. And hopefully, you'll be able to work with some of the, the listeners. So Eric, why don't we start with you and an interesting piece of information I found out about you. You have a license with the Occupational Safety and Health Authority in Tanzania. Can you share with us what that is and why you got involved? Are you referring to more so the, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? <laughs> I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> Tell us about your experience. Yeah. Where are you located, first of all? Where are you located? Just for, you know, perspective. Yeah, for the audience, I'm located out here in Los Angeles in Marina del Rey. A little bit about me is about the Tunisian part, and my last name is, so I'm a first-generation American, and background is from, originally from Canada, that's from Tunisia, and my uh, my mom's from uh, Eastern Europe. So we're all kind of all over the place, and uh, I've got my licenses as a real estate broker, mortgage broker, and engineer. And yeah, that's, that's kind of a quick spiel. So, so where does Tanzania fit in? Tanzania, I think I must have given some money to the prince. <laughs> of Tanzania, that that must be an error. I'm not I'm not sure where the Tanzania part fits in. Okay. Do you have Do you have a license at Occupational Safety and Health Authority? I do. Ocean. Okay. I okay. Do. So where that ties in is I used to work at one of the largest general contractors in the world called Swinnerton Builders. And they promote a lot of education for their staff. And so I wanted to do the OSHA classes and it's pretty rigorous and kind of wanted to pursue shock and effect, learn as much as I can while I'm, while I'm in the role. And so, yeah, that's kind of my quick, quick summary of why I got it. I want to learn more. Okay. So now how about you, Bryce? And let's see if we got this one correct. You received part of your education at the Defense Language Institute at Lackland Air Force Base. Is that correct? It's close. I volunteered there okay. growing up, actually. It was, it was actually a whole a thing my family did. But it is a, actually a very interesting part of my story. So. What did you do there? Tell us. So a little bit a little bit more context on how on the United States military, but we actually work with a lot of our foreign allies on a lot of different things. And a lot of foreign military officers will come to the United States, learn English, and then train with our military. And so San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from originally, is sometimes coined Military City USA because we have so many different Air Force bases and military bases in San Antonio. And so Lackland Air Force Base, military officers come and learn English and then train with our military throughout the United States. And my family growing up, you would hang out with these foreign military officers. So um, starting in sixth grade, almost weekly, I would be having lunch or dinner with folks from Senegal. Azerbaijan, Japan, Egypt, and a lot of other countries, which is a very, I guess, different upbringing in some ways than, than maybe the traditional person in the United States. <laughs> what a great experience, especially coming from the center of the country in Texas to be exposed to people from all over the world. I'm sure that probably had a big impact on you. It really did. Yeah, it, it impacted uh, some later decisions in life and 
I'm sure we could talk about that for hours. So, you know, I won't bore you with, with how all that worked, but it definitely kind of jump started in international things, including international business and innovation abroad and things like that. So, Eric, why don't you tell us how you met Village Capital? More specifically, who did you initially meet? What was your experience like? And how did you get connected with Bryson? Yeah. I, and by the way, Bryson, that definitely beats OSHA, my OSHA certificate. <laughs> <out of> water. <laughs> It's you'll, not a competition. Have, you'll have time to even it up by the end of the, the <laughs> interview. How So how we met actually was I initially applied through a different program of Village Capital. I believe it was to help the general economy through a, a previous cohort, but I wasn't share, wasn't quite there in terms of traction. And we we just weren't, we didn't quite fit their thesis. And so we're part of a, a variety of different organizations, one of which is is established or startup of the year. Uh, we're uh, Bryson and Village Capital are part of that, that program as of mentors as well. And so I did a little spiel with them and they broadcasted me out to their network and I got back on Bryson's radar and Village Capitals. And from there, they reached back out and said, hey, I think you might be a good fit. I said, Yes, it's only been like two years, so patiently waiting for the, the opportunity to work together. And uh, the rest is, is kind of history. That's how we initially connected. So, Bryson, what were your initial thoughts of Eric and ShareApp when you first met? Do you want the, the truth? Or, or I'm just kidding. No, my, my <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> we want nothing less than the truth. So Eric's story is it correct. We had received an application from one of our earlier programs that had a little bit of a different kind of thesis that we were working with. And so more recently, when when our fin health, financial health kind of program came out, we we had, you know, Eric on our radar as well. But my initial thoughts was, okay, this is a it's an interesting company working in the home ownership space. And, you know, we had our eyes on the solutions that were kind of making home ownership more accessible. Uh, and so this idea of co-ownership was 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 interesting, without a doubt. You know, if you look at some of the trends out there, you know, whether it's home ownership becoming more expensive with our you know wonderful interest rates on the rise, or whether it's just trends and demographics on folks, you know, being more willing to co-own things together. Uh, you know, we we saw a startup in that space as being a pretty cool opportunity, and so that was some of my initial you know thoughts of why we were like, okay, let's learn more about this share app thing. And what about Eric? Okay, so my first thoughts on Eric. Yeah, it's it's also another good question. So I, as Eric had mentioned, connected with him kind of in a mentor capacity with the startup of the year, if I'm not mistaken, it was was a while ago. But I do remember connecting on that front. And there was one thing that I do remember stood out and something that we really look for, you know, as we think about founders that you want to work with is receptivity to feedback and advice and whatnot. As we think through like the village capital model, like we take great pride in, in facilitating conversations between the founders that we work with to hopefully allow for peer learning. And in order for that to work, we need to have good receptivity in founders. And it can't be like these, you know, super kind of arrogant, I can do everything and I don't need any help from anyone kind of mentality. And in my initial conversations with Eric, he definitely demonstrated uh, that kind of reception to feedback and, you know, exhibited a, a pleasant component uh, in regards to working together. So, you know, those were those were qualities that came to mind when I first met him. Eric, why don't you talk to us more specifically about ShareApp, how it works and who your user is? Give us some more details on the app itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for the kind words, Bryson. That's uh and I rarely hear those types of those things, so that's awesome. Yeah, so how Share works is Share is a all-in-one digital concierge that focuses on helping renters become homeowners. And we do that by providing not only our tech, our free services, but our very unique loan products and our dedicated support to help individual renters co-own homes together. So this is primarily for owner occupied residents. And there's also an additional value add for anyone who wants to do non-owner occupied. So we not only help individuals co-own homes together to live together in like duplexes and triplexes, but we also give an opportunity for those investors who want to access those first-time home buyer loan programs with a very low barrier to entry and essentially connect them with first-time home buyers who are interested in, in co-ownership building equity in more desirable areas, and then fractionally selling on our marketplace 
within two to five years and, and so on. How do you see share? This is for you, Eric. How do you see share app developing in terms of the technology itself and its ability to scale to the masses? One thing has been around our level of involvement for providing the loan products. Because of there's a lot of regulatory agencies since the OA crisis that have been created. And so one thing is, is there are essentially how much how much work and how much level of involvement do we want to provide to our home buyer from document collection to overall servicing. And so from a scalability standpoint, it really just depends on how, how engaged we want to be with the client, with the home buyer. And then the less engaged we are, the less revenue we can really generate from our lenders. So it definitely is scalable. What we're trying to find though right now is that perfect balance, which is still being developed between having very highly skilled loan officers and real estate brokers providing that dedicated concierge to these renters who have never home owned. They don't know a lot of these documents and, and why should they? They don't have a class on this. And so it's really, we're just trying to find that balance between automation and human interaction. Bryson, what, what are your thoughts on Eric's ambitious goals and his plan to achieve them? 100% confident. I think he can do it. As I kind of mentioned earlier, do you see the kind of trends around share as very positive trends for a business model like share app and, and whatnot? And so I think there's definitely a component where, you know, Eric has that going for him. And I think you'll be able to kind of ride those trends. And at the same time, you know, Eric, after having worked with you, you know, previously and, and gotten to see your story really this last year, year and a half, even, you know, I, I do think that like, you know, Eric has the capacity to make it happen. And going back to the idea of, you know, receptivity to, you know, feedback, I think will be important as you kind of build your team and, and listen to other folks and continue to grow your company. So, you know, I think it's possible and I'm excited to see it happen. Eric, describe for us in detail the process you went through with Village Capital that led to their investment in ShareApp. Yeah, and, and to be clear, so they they provided a grant through their partners. And so some of their partners for this grant was Freddie Mac, PayPal, and TIAA. And so to get to, I guess, from the initial start of the Village Capital program, they were asking, I mean, it's an intense, it's an intense program. I've been, we were part of Mucker Labs, Queen City FinTech Accelerator. And then we wanted to do Village Capital because simply put, they have a very big reach and their partners really align with what we wanted to do. Maybe you could describe to us because you went through a few different things. Why don't you tell us what each one gave you and then why you went to Village Capital? Yeah. So initially we went to Mucker Labs. That's really when we when I first founded the company back in 2019. Right. And they're in Los Angeles. Yeah. In Santa Monica, they right. have the exit in LA history with Honey. And so I still meet with the co-founders fairly regularly. And I started there not knowing what the word KPIs meant. I mean, we're talking, I had very little knowledge. And if you're listening, you know, Will and Eric, my apologies, but you know, that's probably why I look so confused in the meetings initially. So, you know, they, they gave us initial investment and saw that we were continuing to push. We were getting traction from the National Association of Realtors, CBS, a lot of signups. And that was kind of a trigger to them thinking, okay, let's see what they can do. And so with them, it's really, it's weekly phone calls until in pretty much for a year and for them to figure out, okay, well, how are your KPIs, your analytics, and just really early stage companies. From that, we went to Queen City FinTech and we did that. We wanted to improve our product and we were kind of a like out of the lab, but early for an accelerator and trying to continue to find that product market fit. And with Queen City FinTech based in Charlotte, they gave us access to terrific mentors. We had mentorship from companies like State Farm, Progressive, a lot of connections into that space. In fact, one of the advisors we have is the chief of sales at Lending Tree, Will Adams. So they, they were really able to help build out our board and it was a great exposure. And then fast forward about a year after that, that was in 2020 to 2021. And we were looking at ways to, I mean, obviously receive some capital, but not just that, but how can we get in with these huge players in these conversations and have this type of reach and, and more brand exposure. And so Village Capital, they, you know, we were in talks, we made it through multiple rounds of their interview process. And 
right from the get go, you know, they explained it. Bryson was, you know, very clear on the kind of expectations. And I would say out of the class I've done and the accelerators I've been with, they have extremely professional entrepreneurs. It was, you know, I tell my friends this, I'm like, yeah, it was, it was brutal. So what do you expect? I, said, I don't know. I wasn't expecting you know, to be that intense, but great group of, of people and the assignments, it was, as, as kind of Bryson had mentioned, it's all about being receptive and understanding what your your weaknesses are. And we learned a ton about what our weaknesses. And as an example, we were generating monthly reoccurring revenue subscription services as a lead gen provider 2021. But then when we were forced to really look at what are the unit economics, which you know we, we did in the first place, but reevaluating that and bouncing off other entrepreneurs and other advisors really made us realize, let's not focus on three or four different sources of revenue. Let's just be fantastic at one, maybe two. And I think that was a definite key awakening that we found. Bryson, let's go more specifically to Village Capital and the investment process. How exactly does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. If you look at our website, it's, there's a lot going on. And so sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. <laughs> but the, the, core, the core thing that we do at Village Capital is we work actually with large corporations as well as with innovative startups. And we do that through these programs that we run as, you know, Eric and I were both part of the, the FinHealth US 2021 program, Financial Health. And we worked with Freddie Mac, TIAA, and PayPal with that program. And the way that it works is that Freddie Mac, CIA, PayPal, or corporate sponsors will sponsor a specific program, uh, allowing us to dive deep into supporting different founders, as well as providing actually grant capital. Uh, it used to be investments, but we were like, let's be even more founder friendly and started making them actually grant capital, which is usually well received by founders. But that is kind of the way it works a little bit more clearly. But uh, there's some nuance and you know behind the scenes in that process. But you know, I don't know if we want to dive too deep. But I'll I'll leave it to you, Keith. Eric. I'm going to catch you maybe a little off guard here, but we'll we'll see. How has your life changed as you've transitioned to a tech person? In other words, how has technology impacted you in terms of how you think? I have a lot of respect for two-sided marketplaces. Those founders, hats off, because that is way more challenging than, you know, I guess what my expectations were, which, you know, weren't, I didn't necessarily have expectations. So I'm able to, I would say I'm a lot more receptive to what's out there, to market trends, even small nuances like colors on the on the landing page, a small copy changes. What are those driving, what are those things that may drive substantial changes. I'm definitely more honed in. And I would say from like a lifestyle side of things, I mean, I had from a recruitment call to dealing with one of the largest government agencies in the country to now on this great podcast, it's kind of all over the place. So it's always keeps it very, you know, it's always exciting. And what's nice is I'm always learning. Um, I'm never, I'm, I'm never just at a stalemate. So I, I love what I do. Eric, I want to, I want to follow up on that. What what advice would you give or would you like to share with other entrepreneurs that have, you know, a big idea, a big vision to do something, but maybe perhaps don't have the skill set, you know, to execute their business plan? I had a, a perfect example right here where I am more of the idea person. And if you're not, I mean, I can execute, but bring on someone else as either a co-founder or someone else on your team who's better at that. So the team with a skill set as a you know what what we experienced was we were not getting the type of traction and not able to execute on a lot of our tech deliverables early on. And so I brought on a, a co-founder who complemented my essentially my my weaknesses and brought that up. And so be, because of that, we are much more successful and just are now able to recruit much more talent. So I mean you'll notice now. I mean, just you know, a scenario here is that I'm bringing on a team of uh, very intellectual people where I'm now becoming more silent on the conversations because they know more about certain areas than I do. So try and hire people. And it's not all about money. If you're just getting started, people are not incentivized just by money alone. You know, you're looking at companies that do a bunch of layout in the tech space. A lot of those people are great candidates who could be a great value to working with you just starting off. I would say passion is something that's key when you're looking for talent 
to help you get your company off the ground. How are you finding your talent as you go? I am very frugal on spending any money. And so you don't need a lot of money or any money to find. So, so if there's any like recruiters out there, not discrediting your position, you can find it. A lot more talent, a lot faster than probably than what I do. But, but I mean, have they come organically or in the way of introductions or? Yeah, it's been organically. I, I'm a huge advocate on LinkedIn. You get one free job post at all times. So I always have a job post going and that's led to more organic growth, more followers, more engagement on our social media posts and then angel list as well. So it really just depends on the type of position you're looking for. So if you're looking for more a marketing individual or more startup experience, probably angel list. But if you're looking for more traditional, like a loan officer, LinkedIn has been the most fruitful. Bryson, tell us how Village Capital is working with Eric to support him and his vision and his role as a CEO. Yeah, so we work with Startups Center Network in a kind of a variety of ways. You know, as we kind of run a program, we work very closely with them you know, during that time period. And so we're no longer in that kind of intensive phase of working with Eric and Cher as a whole, but we still, of course, love to work with founders that are in our network, as I mentioned earlier. And, and some of what that looks like is we really do focus in on help, helping founders with kind of investment readiness and whatnot. And so that can look like a lot of different things, whether it's like looking at a pitch stack, providing feedback there, I particularly love to dive into financial models and you know all things financial, or whether it's making warm introductions to other investors in our network. These are just some of the things that we'll, we'll do with the startups that we work with. And folks that work with us also get access to you know other benefits, AWS credits, and, and things like that. But you know I think typically what founders find most valuable is is tapping into the, the Village Capital Network. Following up on that, what advice would you give to other venture capital firms mm. that are looking for better outcomes with their portfolios? It's a really good question. And I've actually talked to some some VCs close to VillCap not too too long ago about that exact question. So very well timed, Keith. I don't I don't know how you how you realize that. But one of the things that I think some VCs are, are thinking about right now is is really portfolio company support. Maybe they're you know, maybe not making as many investments in the current market environments. And um, Village Capital, we're very much known for this idea of really peer support when it comes to founders. And I, I strongly recommend for those out there with, with uh, you know, portfolios to consider avenues or ways to facilitate interaction between the founders and your portfolio. You know, as a VC, I'm sure you are very knowledgeable about a lot of different things, but sometimes a founder to founder conversation can go a really long way. And so always recommend that you kind of tap into that resource that you have as other founders in your portfolio and, and to connect those in, in facilitated ways is I think very helpful. Eric, what advice would you give to other tech founders that are considering partnering with a VC firm like Village Capital? Money does not equal money. And so make sure that when you when you do reach out to the appropriate VC, well, well, first of all, what I learned from Village Capital, one thing is that, I mean, it may seem obvious, but there's all sorts of different capital that you can raise. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't need to come from VC money. It can come from loans or there's a lot of different ways, grant. and uh, But choose your partners carefully because we've been fortunate enough where we, we were given the opportunity to be a little more selective on who we want to work with as a VC. And so make sure that they add value where you, you can talk to them. They're founder friendly. And a good way to learn more about them is look at their portfolio and you can, I mean, reach out to, it may seem strange, but either their past found their past investments or you can find that information like on TechCrunch or itchbook but just be careful on, on who you reach out to and if you have a another connection to make a warm intro that's always the best way to do it but if not don't let that stop you because when i first started out i had pretty much no founder friends uh and so the way i learned is just trial and error and so it only was because my I started reaching out on LinkedIn, message after message, which slowly led to more interviews and meetings. And then finally, we started seeing a lot more interest. And so don't think of ways that will hinder you. Just there's no better time to do it now because your time now is less valuable than it is tomorrow.
Bryson, what would you say to other potential investors if they asked you about joining you and your investment in ShareApp and working with Eric and his team? Yeah, so I sometimes get that opportunity to talk about you know companies that we we've, we've worked with and whatnot, and you know I always recommend you know if investors are at least in the space to certainly you know have a call with with you know founders that are of interest to them. You know, I, typically what we'll do is like we'll share very quick blurbs with other investors in our network and stuff that might be interested in engaging with you know some of the startups through our programs and stuff. And yeah, I mean it's 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 a little nudge there. I try not to you know sway other folks you know too much when it comes to companies I've gotten to work with. But I w- I would recommend as well if you're specifically looking. At share or other companies in kind of the co-ownership spaces. I mean, take a look at the other trends that are going on out there. And I think you'll kind of see that there's some there's some positive signs for a company uh, like share. And so. so my next question is actually for both of you. So let's start with Eric. What have you learned through your working relationship with Village Capital? It's a lot. You know, we started with the founder origin stories. You know, I have a very diverse background. So I could talk about my origin stories for like an endless amount of time. So condensing your pitch to elevator pitch to a 90 second pitch. And so really consolidating your, your message, uh, that, was, that was definitely big. And thinking about your audience, why should they care? So being more self-aware and taking the time to evaluate your company, because everything is moving so fast that you can kind of just... Just go with the rhythm of failure. And, and you're thinking, okay, we're on the right path, but are we? And so I would just say generally it was being very much more self-aware and tailoring my pitch and just overall company health. And yeah, I mean, I learned a lot of different things. I, I strongly recommend other entrepreneurs. If they qualify for their thesis, I'd recommend applying. How about you, Bryson? What have you learned through your working relationship with Eric and his team? I got to dive deeper into co-ownership and uh, learning more about that space and the challenges that exist in that space. You know, one of the one of the joys of my job is, you know, I get to work with several different founders and, and dive deep into each of their kind of little, you know, microcosms of innovation and whatnot. And home ownership is a, a topic that is on my mind and one that I like want to continue to learn more and more about. And, you know, specifically when it comes to this idea of, you know, folks co-buying together, co-investing together in, in you know, this asset class, I was I was pretty interested. And so I learned a lot from Eric in, in just understanding the problems that exist in that kind of subsector and also kind of the opportunities there. So yeah, that's, a, that's a quick answer. Well, that's terrific. You know, you're both learning something from each other. So, you know, that's, it's good to hear that it's, it goes both ways. So Bryson, how may future investors or strategic partners or tech companies reach you if they're interested in working with Village Capital? So one thing I would recommend for folks out there that are interested in connecting with us is to, you can certainly go to our website, villcap.com, and there are all sorts of things we're doing. And, and if you're kind of in the impact space, you'll generally fall into under one ca- category here and there. Usually we have instructions on how to like connect with us, whether you're an investor and you want to you know hear more about the startups you're working with or whether you're a startup wanting to work with but if you want to talk to me specifically you're certainly welcome to reach out and I can also point you in the right place so I mean I'll share my email address if, if you want to reach out but it's bryson.kern at vilcap.com so that's b r y s o n period h e a r n e at vilcap Dot com. Happy to you know point you in the right direction on how you can work with Bill Cap. Great. And how about you, Eric? How can people contact you if they're interested in learning more about Share App and and getting involved? Yeah, I'm just glad we just got Bryson's email. That's yeah, I've been waiting for that for months. <laughs> <laughs> but to reach out, just go to you can either visit our website at www.cher.app. That's www.share.app to create your free account and reach out to us. Or if you want to reach out to our, our company email to answer any questions, that's that's a share at share.app. That's C-H-E-R at C-H-E-R dot A-P-P. And if you're a, you know, a, a tech founder or an investor that's looking, you know, we are not fundraising now, but towards the end of this year, you can reach me directly at my personal email, E-R-I-C at C-H-E-R dot A-P-P. 
Terrific. Bryson and Eric, thank you both for sharing your story and your experience as well as your time today. We wish you both all the best with your endeavors and thank you on behalf of the audience. And we hope everyone that's listening finds the conversation valuable and enlightening. Thank Thank you. you so much, Keith. It was a great time. It was. It was. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Funding and Disrupting. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, AuraCo.com, to learn more about working directly with Aura Collective's exclusive technology PR team. They'll help you craft your message, get noticed in the press, and help you get your venture to the funding finish line. Again, you can visit them at www.AuraCo.com. Keep funding and keep disrupting.